We've been in a series where we've really been unpacking indecision. It's been helpful for the single folk and the married folk alike. And uh, today is no different. I really believe that what God has for us today, uh, I'm gonna categorize this as a simple but deeply profound word that if you can unpack this and apply it into your life, it will literally change the way you follow the Holy Spirit. And I wanna do this in a Scripture in Galatians. So would you open your Bible or you stay standing? Galatians, go there with me as we enter into this series or continue in this series. Yes, no, maybe. Galatians chapter 5, I wanna read from verse 16. It says, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two, these two forces are constantly fighting each other so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. Today I wanna do some teaching specifically around the idea of what to do with desire. What to do with desire. And trust me, it's gonna be a helpful and practical and applicable sermon for your life today. Are you ready for the Word of God? All right, if you are ready, I want you to find five of the best looking people around you. Your selection, your selection. And tell them congratulations for being one of the five. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. So I don't know if you realize this or not, but yesterday was hot. How many people realize that? The rest of you just stayed in the air conditioning. But yesterday was hot, which is very exciting because it means summer is coming to California. I gotta tell you, I love a summer, Cal a Californian summer. This, this was the whole reason. This was actually what, not the whole reason we moved. We moved to start the church. However, <laughs> however, it was my expectation is that California was a perpetual Californian summer. I didn't know you had winter here. However, I have come to terms with, which does actually make summers all the better. You know, when you go through a hard season, you come into the blessing. It makes you appreciate it. it, makes you love it. And I love summer. In fact, this summer is set to be the best summer in the history of summers. We've got so much going on in the church. No longer are we locked down in summer. We have the freedom. We've got a new church building we're moving into. We've got Amen Conference coming up this summer. It's incredible. It's incredible. What a time to be alive, I'm telling you. It's the greatest time to be alive. In the history of people who have ever been alive, now is the greatest time. If you didn't know that, congratulations. Just because you're alive right now, it's a great time. And I don't know what you have planned for summer. I don't know if you're a planned family. We are a planned family, and we've been discussing summer plans for some time now. In fact, I think it helps me get ready for summer. It helps me endure the winter as we plan for summer. We used to just be the spontaneous family. You know, when the kids were little, and something happened. Somewhere along the way, things just shifted, where we went just from doing stuff, and the kids just came along, to where now we discuss with kids what we're doing. Anybody there? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody still in the naive state where you just do stuff and kids come along? Yeah, yeah, good for you. Enjoy it while you can. Now you have to have a committee meeting anytime as a family you want to plan anything. And I remember a couple months ago we discussed, hey girls, what are we going to do for summer this year? And, and they started throwing out European cities. They're like Paris. I'm like, what? Yeah, that'd be nice. They're throwing out resorts. I'm like, sorry. Hello. Have you met me? My name's Dad. Uh, I was thinking camping. <laughs> like, like uh, my mistake, I offered it out there. What would you like to do? And they were honest. But they forget that we used to go camping all the time. That was what we did as a family. We'd go, we'd go camping. And I was like, hey, I was, thinking, I was thinking camping in a tent. And they're like, nah. -uh. I'm like, hang on, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let me remind you how much you used to enjoy this. You loved it. You loved it. You will love it again. No, you, 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 you loved it. I'm like, what, what happened? And they literally said, well, Dad, our, our desires changed. 
Which I've realized, living in a household of women, that's a woman's prerogative. <laughs> to change her mind and make new decisions. But it did get me thinking, that sentence, our desires change. The, the idea of desire is a, is, a, is a funny one, especially when it comes to being decisive. That's what this series is about, emboldening us as a follower of Jesus to be more decisive. But when it comes to being decisive, I'm wondering, are we meant to be directed by our desires or are our desires meant to direct us? It's probably not what you think, to be honest with you. Actually, maybe I could build the tension just a little bit more this morning and ask, as Christians, what is it that we're actually meant to do with desire? Now, now I ask this because within this series where we're trying to overcome indecision, a lot of indecision actually derives from a conflict within in the area of desire. Did you know that? That you have desires. There are desires within you that cause a, a conflict. It's... It's ultimately uh, conflicting because as Christians, we're meant to be confident. I mean, we've got so much to be confident about as believers. Confident in where we go when we die, we have eternity. Confident in our identity in Christ Jesus. Confident that we'll never be alone, that He'll always be with us. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. That's good reason for confidence in this life. And when it comes to being a decisive person, I would love to draw on the confidence. So why is it that believers struggle so often with indecision? Struggle being decisive. Well, to be honest with you, if we are going to be decisive, there is something that we need to acknowledge and something that we need to realise, which is that when it comes to the area of desire, you are conflicted. <laughs> you are conflicted. Let me just get that out there for an early amen and something you can agree with right at the beginning of the sermon that you're conflicted. And if you're pretending that you're not conflicted, you're straight up lying, you're in church, stop it. You're conflicted. You're conflicted because you're human. You're made with human desires. There are these desires that the Bible, Paul reveals that are constantly at war and conflict with each other. That there are these desires for good at the same time within the same human being, there's desires for evil. This is a conflict that's constantly waging war within your own body. Now you've got desires of the flesh, the sinful nature. You've got desires of the spirit. And these are all bottled up in the same person. The way Paul presents it to the Galatians is he says this. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what the sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil. That's the first thing we have to acknowledge. Stop floating around on, on, on your ministry mat. You, you, there's a sinful nature within you that desires to do evil. You got to acknowledge that. Secondly, it says it's just the opposite of what the spirit wants. We have to realize that. It goes on to say the spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other so that you ain't free to carry out your good intentions. Now, now when writing to the Romans, I mean, he put it really poetically there. When writing to the Romans, I don't know the makeup of Roman believers. But they seemed to be a little, they needed a little bit more blunt than the Galatian believers. They needed him to put it into layman's terms. So I love the way he wrote it to the Romans in Romans chapter 7, talking about this conflict within. He, he says it this way in verse 15, I, I don't really understand myself. For I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. <laughs> Instead, I do what I hate. He says, but if I know what I'm doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So I'm not the one doing wrong, it's sin living within me that does it. And I know nothing good lives in me, that is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. Paul gives us this flurry of contradictions that articulate perfectly in layman's terms the conflict between the sinful nature and the spirit. That there is a, there is a, there is a side to us and our desires that are constantly leaning towards the evil proclivities of life. Even Paul, an apostle. If you're not going to say amen, I'm getting my amen from the scripture. The apostle, church planter, builder of the kingdom, commissioned by God to take the good news to the Gentiles is revealing all saying, I struggle. I got a conflict. I'm conflicted. I, 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 I want to do what is good, but I don't do it. Anybody can say amen like this morning. I want to just make sure I'm preaching to the right church. Like, like there's, there's good I want to do, I don't do. There's, 
good that I should do that I don't do. There's bad things that I do that I don't want to do. I'm a wretched person. That was the conclusion of, Paul, I've got this conflict within me. And what we see is this series of omissions perfectly articulates the tension that exists in the believer and explains why it is so often we battle with indecision. It's no wonder we battle with indecision. We've got these two natures at war. We've got these two things constantly fighting each other. Because while we have a redeemed nature in Christ, which is our spirit, we still desire the things of the flesh. And Paul makes it very clear. These, these two things are constantly, two elements, are constantly in conflict, infiltrating and influencing our decisions. This is what affects our decisions. In fact, desire is difficult to deny and just as difficult to direct. Now, I, I, said, I said that summer is coming. Okay. And a lot of us have probably, some of us, have probably been working for some months now as wise people on the summer body. I said some of us. I should have said some of you. <laughs> because while I do have a shape in mind, knowing that summer is coming, it's inevitable there will be at least a moment around a pool deck or somewhere where the shirt has to come off. I'm not going to be the guy that swims with the shirt on. I'm not going to blame it on being sun smart. I am going to have to take it off at some point. And everyone's going to be very disappointed. And even though I desire a certain shape for some, the reality is I really desire French fries. I love them. Like more. More than the body. I love the fries. I'm here for it. Turn to 42. I'm ready to retire on the body. I'm ready. Let's go into full fry season. Amen. No? Okay. And it's, it's interesting how much desire would drive you. Like literally, if, if I said like fried chicken, I know I've set in motion something within your soul. When no longer you are yearning for spiritual food, you just want that dirty fried chicken. That's what you want, the oily. You're already door dashing. Some of you got your phones out right away and just said, where are we going for lunch, honey? Let's get through this sermon. But, but it's amazing how, how desire is a driving force in our life. That even beyond what we want, the, the desire can drive us in a different direction. And this is what often causes a conflict within the believer. Knowing what I should do, but what I want to do and I don't blame it like I want to. I say it's that evil nature, but really it's what I want. It's what I, it's what I want. That's a strong force in the life of the believer. So here's my question. What do we do with desire? And better still, how do we use it to become decisive? Because just denying desires has not worked. Would you agree? hasn't worked, hasn't been successful, even though the religious have tried to preach it, just deny your desires. It hasn't been effective in changing de desires. In fact, desires are built from God. You are wired with desire. Your framework is built with desire. Whether you call it an appetite, uh, the, the desire there is from God. If you didn't have desire, you would just do nothing. <laughs> you would be a waste of space. Just doing nothing. Not doing it, not getting up, no motivation to change the world, to change anything, to better your life, to even eat, because everything has desire attached to it. It's how you're wired as a human. The reason you get up in the morning is because there is a desire to get up and do something or an obligation, one of the two. <laughs> but desire is designed from God. So what are we meant to do with Desire. Well, I want to give you a few things today to help you write notes and to ultimately help you frame your decisions and ultimately help you overcome indecision. So, so with your notepads ready, first thing I want you to understand is that you are divided. Okay, that's the, the plain truth. We've established that. That you're conflicted because of the sinful nature. However, I also need to realize as well as I have established that you are divided, that you are conflicted, that you have worldly desires, you have evil desires of the flesh, the sinful nature. I have to also remind you at the same time that you have what's called a high calling in Christ. Thank you, youth pastor Jackie. She's clapping because she knows how important this is to get into young people because by the time they get to your age, you're not convinced anymore. 
When I talk about you having a high calling in Christ, none of your spirits left. You more kind of went inward because you know that the battle of your desires doesn't look like it's producing a high calling in Christ. Your life may not look like someone who's living out the high calling in Christ. And maybe you feel like you're a long way off from your high calling in Christ. But regardless of how you, whatever the lens is that you want to put over your life, I am here today to tell you that you have a high calling in Christ. You don't have an average calling. You don't have a low calling. You don't have a base calling. The only calling that you have is a high calling. The reason you have a high calling is because you are highly favoured of the Lord. You are God's special person. This is where you are. The moment you come to Christ, Christ's love for you, the fact that He chose you, made you special and unique to the point where God's like, I love you so much. I can't wait to be with you. And I'm giving you a unique high calling. And it's high because it comes from Him. The Bible says He is seated in heavenly places. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And therefore, because we've been raised to new life, we've also been seated in high places with Christ. So the only calling that we can have is a high one. It's royal in design. It's got authority and kingdom ambassador attached to it. So therefore, my job as a pastor, if I can do one thing really well in my tenure as a minister is to remind you and to illuminate to you that you have a high calling. You're highly favoured of the Lord. They have a high calling in Christ. And here's what's helpful to understand. So often we look at the high calling and we miss the fact that God has given us favour. That God has blessed us, that God has given us insights from heaven, that God has put a purpose in front of us, an assignment that we are called to achieve. It's a calling, it's a commission from God who hasn't just given you an average job. He's matched it with your unique gift set from the Holy Spirit to achieve great things, to have great influence on this life, to extend the eternal purpose of the kingdom of heaven in a unique way through your unique personality. In fact, you thought your personality wasn't the right fit. Your personality is perfect for the purpose of God in the way that He wants to use you. That's freeing. That's really freeing. But you have to be determined of it. You can't be unsure of it. High calling doesn't work in uncertainty. You have to be determined of some things in this life. For the effectiveness of your high calling to be effectual in this life, you have to be determined that I've got a high calling. And as believers, there is certainty. That's where we live in. We live in certainty while the world lives in uncertainty. There are some things that we are sure of that produces the Christian confidence that gives the Christian an advantage over the world is that you live with a confidence in Christ and a certainty. I'm trying to preach you happy before I can preach the meat of the Word today. Trying to get some amens in this Presbyterian church. The fact that you are highly favoured, that you have certainty in Christ. I, I, love, I love the way that the apostle, he, he, the Paul, he, he puts it to the church in Philippi. He wants them to know of some things that you can be certain of. And he says it this way in Philippians 1, 6. He says, I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue His work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Paul was convinced and certain and convicted that God is able to finish what he set out to start. The reason that's good news for you is you thought that maybe I don't have a high calling because there's been some mistakes in my life. But Paul's confidence wasn't in me or him. It was in Christ being able to accomplish what he set out to do. Regardless of how you got in the way or abided or or, or, or didn't work with God, it's like he can achieve it. He can achieve it. He can achieve it. He can achieve it still. That word is for somebody in here. He can achieve it still. Oh man, I want to preach. I want to preach. In fact, The entire second letter to Timothy is a revealer of our high calling in Christ Jesus and Paul urging Timothy to be determined of it, to be determined of it, to not not wonder any longer. It's, It's revealed to be determined of it. And something that is a potentially new understanding, I feel for many believers, is that our high calling in Christ is not the destination of our life. It's the origin. You see, the reason your spirit didn't leap within you is because you thought you had a way to go to achieve the high calling in Christ. I didn't feel like you argued with me that there is potentially a high calling. The conflict comes with you having the high calling already. Because sometimes we approach our life as if I'm obtaining the high calling. 
that if I can make the right decisions in life and if I can guide my life in such a way that I reach the level of high calling, then I will achieve everything that God has for me. But I'm here to illuminate to you that that's not how it works in the kingdom. The way it works in the kingdom is the moment you give your life, God gives you a high calling. So your high calling in Christ is your origin, not your destination. It's the starting point of your life. Oh, this is such good preaching. It's, it's, it's the commencement point that God doesn't say, well, let's see how you behave. Let's see how you walk this thing called Christianity. Let, let's see how you... No, no, He's like, hey, great, you came to me. You came to me and re- let me redeem everything. Let me give you a high calling in Christ Jesus. Let me give you every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Let me empty heaven over your life and give you everything, holding nothing back. So to know this is so significant and important if you're actually gonna be able to be a decisive person in life. Because I need to locate myself. If I'm gonna know how to make the right decisions in line with God's will for my life, I need to know where I am. And you get a bearing. I realized this in a profound way this week. I was able to take my eldest daughter, Dia. She's graduating. We went on a little F1. She's for, like she's, she's Formula One mad. She's Formula One crazy. She loves high octane sports. And that worries me and makes me happy all in the same time. <laughs> and so we were able to go on a, a trip to Miami. We went to the F1. It was amazing. And they had like the whole circuit set up around the Hard Rock Stadium. They had all these different stations you could go to and see motor cars and motor racing and motor merch, everything. It was incredible. And we're weaving around, taking photos and trying to see you know, famous car drivers. We're just having a, a blast. And before we knew it, we were like 40 minutes away from where our seats were and the race was scheduled to start real soon. And so we're like, okay, we're gonna hustle, but where are we? Where are we? Now, something I've come to really love and appreciate as a man, in my younger years, I didn't ask for directions and I still don't because I'm a man. (laughs) However, I have come to love a map. Maps are great. Maps mean you don't need to ask for directions. You can figure it out yourself. All the men said. And my favorite thing on the map, to be honest with you, is that you are here. I love it. I love it in a mall. I love it in Miami. I love it everywhere. I I love being able to locate myself because with that, the map is just messy. I might have the idea of where I'm meant to be and what I'm meant to do, but without locating where I am, I'm gonna miss the next steps. And this is where most believers are getting confused. You feel like you're trying to reach high calling. God says you're already at high calling. Would you work from that orientation? Would you work from that origin? And when I work from that origin, my decisions change. The direction of my life, I get bearings from understanding who I am in Christ. I have a high calling. Without that, I'm, I'm wondering. I, got, I, might, I might know, I might have an idea of where to go, but I've got no direction to step in. Which is why it's vitally important as decisive believers to understand not only that we have a high calling, but you've got to carry a deep conviction of it. This is your starting point. That I need to be determined. When I'm determined, then I can expect to be directed. As Paul suggests to the Galatians, check it out. He starts out by instructing the church from his own opinion and wisdom, he says in verse 16, so, I love the way, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. I love the simple instruction. So, so I say, as an apostle, as a leader, I say, let, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Now, to be honest with you, I don't know about you, but the fact and the knowledge that there is a a spirit, a Holy Spirit that wants to help me guide and navigate my life, that's encouraging. That I don't have to do this life on my own. That I don't have to figure it out. I've got a, I've got a guide, a Sherpa to life. I've literally got, I've got a Holy Spirit who's gonna direct and guide the, the, the journey of my life. That is so stinking encouraging. However, while I'm thankful for the suggestion, Paul, my question is how? I don't know about you, but I've been sitting in church a long time. And I've heard many times the encouragement to be led by the Spirit and heard many amens. But where's the description on how? Like, what does that actually look like Monday morning? What is that? Like, what do I do? I'm ready. Guide me. How? 
And what I want to reveal to you may be a little bit confronting to some of you because you've been maybe in church for a long time and you've been in different settings and you've got this idea that's been presented to you of what it's like to follow the Holy Spirit. But I, I might bust some ideas and mentalities this morning on what that looks like. Because honestly, I think most of the time we follow the Holy Spirit like, like that, that summer pool game Marco Polo. You, you played that before? Like a pulse check. Just checking in. Just checking in. Where are you, Holy Spirit? Ben, come up here. Help me up. Youth Pastor Ben, come up here real quick. I'm sure you played this game. Can you swim? Kind of. Kind of. Cool. Well, this is a great game for you. Close your eyes. And this is what we do. We, we maybe just kind of wander around aimlessly not knowing where we are and hoping that we find it. So when we need it, we cry out, Holy Spirit. C- give me a Marco. Marco. Polo. <laughs> and that's honestly how we approach it. <laughs> Keep moving. Don't stay stagnant in your calling, man of God. <laughs> and then when we feel like we're getting out of the way, we, we cry out again. Marco. <laughs> Polo. And this is... What it feels like to walk with the Holy Spirit sometimes. Go and sit down. It feels like we're searching in the dark for the leading of the Holy Spirit. Just pulse check, pulse check. When I need God's direction, when I get need God's leading, I'm just sending it out there in the atmosphere, hoping that I get something back like a, a dolphin resonance or something coming into my spirit so I can swim in that direction. This, while prayer is certainly powerful when it comes to communicating with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is a person who wants a dialogue and a discussion, who will direct your life, speak into your world, illuminate and revelate the Word of God so that it will give you fuel for the day and bread for your life, but also sustenance for other people. It will give you ammunition that you can give into somebody's life at the right time. The Holy Spirit does all of that. However, I want to offer to you and suggest that you've been missing probably the most significant way that the Holy Spirit guides your life for years. And it's, way more profound than you think. It's actually way more powerful than you think. And Paul reveals it to the Galatians. He doesn't just give them an empty suggestion. Hey, you know what I suggest? You let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. He actually tells us how as well. Check it out. He he, he says it this way. He says, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Great. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves, even, even greater. The sinful nature wants to do evil. I agree with that which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. I acknowledge that. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. Did you see that? These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you're not free to carry out your good intentions. Verse 18, but when you are directed by the Spirit, you're not under obligation to the law of Moses. Okay, so there's a few things in here I need to unpack for you to help you today. In these few verses, Paul reveals the way the Holy Spirit directs our life. You see, believe it or not, your desires are not your enemy. How much wasted energy are you spending on trying to deny desires? Stay with me, stay with me. Desires are not your enemy. They're an inbuilt human element. Like your appetite, as we established Like your desire to go to Paris, girls. (laughs) You can't just switch off desire. So how does the Holy Spirit use desire? As humans, we're driven by desire. Whether it's an appetite or an attraction, desire is the driving force. And so the Holy Spirit works not through denying our desires, but through deepening our desires. This is the realm of the Holy Spirit that takes what is a natural desire or or the way that Paul puts it, a, a sinful desire, and instead of ignoring that and pretending that doesn't exist in your life, reveals that there is a conflict because now I'm not just born of the flesh, I'm born of the Spirit. There are some other desires that are at war with those sinful desires. And these desires are a deeper desire. You see, the the, the reason your sinful nature is also called the flesh 
is because it's surface, it's shallow, it's not deep. The sinful nature desires shallow things, fleeting things, temporal things, easy things, quick things, fast things. That's what the sinful nature desires because it's shallow. However, the Spirit in contrast is deeper. It's the inner man. And the Holy Spirit is always trying to deepen your desires. This is why Paul brings in the law of Moses. He's like, the, he says this in verse 18, he says, but when you are directed by the Spirit, you're not under obligation to the law of Moses because the law of Moses represented law or religion. That you could literally deny your desires. You could do the act of religion, but still be wretched in your heart. It required no heart change. It required no heart submission. I could just do the act, but without any application or change. So that's why he said, but when you're led by the Spirit, you're not obligated to the law of Moses. It's actually a deeper work that the Holy Spirit's doing within you. And the Holy Spirit grabs you in the area of desire that drives your life. The Holy Spirit works on the inner man. He takes you from fleeting surface desires, fleshy desires, to to, to intentional desires that align with your high calling in Christ Jesus. Ah, let me help you, let me help you. What this means is is when I'm led by the the flesh, all I want is the fun. (laughs) And if I live by the law, I have, to, I have to trade up fun for boring. This is what I have to do. So that's not attractive. It doesn't work. But what the Holy Spirit does is different from the law of Moses where I could want fun but just do boring and just persevere and just grit through it and deny the fact that I wanna do fun. The Holy Spirit knows that we're wired with desire. So when, when the Holy Spirit, when He deepens our desires, the decision isn't between fun and boring. The decision is still between fun or fulfilling. You see, He, he still draws on your desires, but says, why don't we take it deeper? And instead of just fun for the moment, what if we were to fulfill something? What if we lived a life that fulfilled the high calling in Christ? You've already got it. You've just got to fulfill it. You've just got to walk it out. You've got to walk it. Well, what if, what if He took something that was not just about living a temporal circle, going around the same pattern, enduring the same heartbreak and the same things, just for a fleeting fun moment. But what if I was to live my life where I was pursuing, fulfilling the calling of Christ on my life? What if I was to live up to my full potential of influence? What if I was to pursue the things that matters and has significance? What if I was to connect my life to the eternal Kingdom of God, where I didn't live a fleeting life, but I live for fulfilment in Christ Jesus? Oh man, it changes it. The Holy Spirit uses desires. See, you thought I had to... Where are you, Holy Spirit? Where are you, Holy Spirit? I got, I got no problem with seeking the Holy Spirit. I love it. Go for it. Let's do it. Wait on Him. But most of the time, the Holy Spirit's leading you in desire. That as you spend time with Him, He's deepening what was a fleshy, shallow desire and giving it purpose, putting meaning behind it, putting significance in it. That as you allow that driving force to guide your life, you'll find that being decisive isn't a hard decision. Do I go left? Do I go right? I'm just walking in the will of God. I find that He has taken hold of my life where I don't want to sit there in the base things and the temporal things. I want to live higher. I don't want just my life to be changed, but God, use my life to change lives. God, I want to fulfill the grand, great, high calling that You have for me. This is what it means to be ultimately led by the Holy Spirit. This is what Paul says, so let God, let the Holy Spirit guide your life. Let Him, let Him deepen it. When you're in the presence of God, let Him deepen it. Let Him confront some things for sure. It's what David prayed, God, would you find any wicked way within me? That was talking about the flesh things. And when you locate them, God, would you deepen the desires for the things of you? Can I not just stay stuck in the same routine of life, but God, could I graduate that season and desire the true fulfilment of knowing that You're with me, that You're using me in my purpose to fulfill what is already mine in Christ Jesus. That's empowering because I'm not trying to earn it. I'm not trying to work for it. I got it so I can do it with the Holy Spirit as my guide. Would you stand to your feet? I'm out of time, but I need to pray for you. Because something in my spirit really felt that when I illuminated to you that you have a high calling, there was too much doubt in the room for that to stick. <laughs> like you're still questioning that. And I'm here today to tell you that 
God has a unique and divine purpose for your life. That He is a good God with good gifts, with good calling, with a high calling in Him. And the key to living a decisive life is to be determined of that. So I want you to do something. I want you to close your eyes right where you are. We're gonna pray. I'm not gonna pray for everybody that has doubted their high calling. I'm gonna pray for every person in here that has been confused around the choosing of God. Maybe you've, maybe you've disqualified it because honestly, you're looking at it through the lens of your life and the mistakes and decisions that somehow you may have derailed the calling of God. God's gifts and calling are irrevocable. It's God that gives them. It is on your life. But God allows you to be in a redemptive moment where you come back to the high calling, where you step back up to what He has called you to be. So right across this place, with every head bowed, every eye closed, if this is for you, I'm gonna pray for those that need to be reminded or the revelation of their calling in Christ Jesus. I want you just to open your hands or open your heart and allow God to minister to you right now. God, you see every person with their palm upward to heaven. God, I pray right now, Lord, that you would remind them by your Spirit that they are your special servant, that they are your special person. God, that you have called them, chosen them, ordained them and anointed them, Lord, for the purpose that is set uniquely for them. Lord, would they know their identity in you? God, would they not be one bit confused that they are less than or struggling to achieve, but Lord, they are commissioned by Christ Himself with a high calling in You, with a great purpose, with a great influence, with a mandate from heaven. Not an accident, purposed by heaven, designed by God, known by God for great works. I pray, Lord, that that would be sealed upon their heart. That they wouldn't walk wondering, but would walk with a head held high, knowing that I'm an agent of Christ Jesus. I'm a citizen of heaven. I got a high calling.